It is my great pleasure to be in conversation here with Dr. Añez. Um, she joins us tonight to discuss reverse innovation. How do we make it feasible? And her thoughts on what the global health community can do to create innovative partnerships that result in better health outcomes. But I did want to tell you a little bit about Dr. Añez as we were getting started tonight because she is a woman of great accomplishment. Rwanda's healthcare sector was largely non-existent following the 1994 genocide. Dr. Paul Farmer of Partners in Health credits Dr. Añez for helping turn the country's health sector around. She insisted that health, physical, mental, and social health were, a hu were all a human right for all. That meant reaching people everywhere, regardless of their ethnic group, location, or income. Today, health insurance coverage is practically universal in Rwanda at more than 90%, and the poorest receive free health care. On average, Rwandans see a doctor almost twice a year. Compare this to 1999, when the average Rwandan saw a doctor once every four years. And today, more than 97% of children are vaccinated per WHO standards. Health outcomes have also seen rapid improvements. Three statistics to share with you. Under Dr. Agnia's leadership at the Rwanda National AIDS Control Commission, the number of people dying from AIDS almost halved, and new infections were also roughly cut in half. Rwanda has recorded the fastest ever drop in under five mortality across all, uh, compared to all countries. And maternal mortality today has dropped more than 80% since the genocide. Rwanda is the only country in Sub-Saharan Africa to achieve the Millennium Development Goals in health. And as she told me in the green room, one year before the target date. And Dr. Anis, you've done this all on a very limited budget, and we have a lot to learn from you and your journey. So I'm th so thrilled you're here with us tonight. I thought I would start by asking Dr. Anya's a little bit about her background. She's a pediatrician, and now she leads a university, the University of Global Health Equity. Will you tell us a little bit about how you started as a practitioner and now leading a university? So, um, good evening, everybody. Uh, I always wanted to give quality care, and um, uh, myself first, but also teaching. I was teaching, even being a pediatrician in France, it was in a teaching hospital, so I was teaching resident. Uh, coming back in Rwanda, I was teaching when I was giving care. And uh, now what I'm doing is the same. I'm teaching uh, other people, young people, how to provide quality care. Mm. For the time being, through the master program, how to organize, because I had to learn it. Uh, like Paul Farmer, like many, how to organize the uh, health sector to be capable to provide that care, because you need to create the system where you are capable to work. So for me, it's the same. The objective is uh, to contribute to healing, and you can do that through providing care or to organize the provision of care or to teach how to organize the provision of care. So it's the same. No change. When we look at uh, the background and what you've done in Rwanda, will you tell us a little bit, too, about what you see as some of the greatest successes? And I'd love to hear, too, how you're blending that into your teaching. Um, the success of uh, uh, it's to focus on providing care where people ex live. Uh, it's, a man it's almost mandatory in the developing world because uh, there are few cars, people even uh, doesn't have a motorbike. So you need to create a system where you reach out to provide the care the people need. Don't wait for them to come to you, they are dead before. So how do you do that? Uh, you create a strong linkage between the community and the health facilities, and in between, uh, you create system to provide care without them to come to the health facilities. By that, you do, you create strong community health workers program. Uh, in Rwanda, you have three community health workers per village, elected by the village, the, the terms of reference is to know how to write, to read, 
and be capable to know, to learn how to use a phone. That's it. When the people elected them, the Ministry of Health is in charge to make sure that they receive a standardized training. Six weeks on syndromic approach. A child this age come with fever, that's what you do. The, the tree of decision. Hmm? Um, they provide a treatment for pneumonia, cough with fever, diarrhea. Um, they also provide family planning, uh, the tablets, the condom, but also injections. Uh, for this, it's good because you need to deregulate. Yeah, many people who doesn't have time to go in injected community level doesn't want in some country doesn't want those who could do to do it. And most of the women who are pregnant and don't want it, uh, it's just that the day, X day, they have to go. They yeah. cannot go because it was raining, a child was sick or whatever. Hmm? So having that in your village, meaning you can go anytime hmm? between the lunch and the dishes, hmm? anytime. Mm -hmm. So also they, they provide advice and and. But you have also a new type of cadre that will follow after uh, four months training, cr chronic disease and end of life at home. So that means the community health workers are supervised by nurses regularly. They report all with their phone. You can you know every month what happened at community level. And you can say th that part of the country is doing well. That part seems to have a problem. That part seems to do so well that we are going to go there to see what they have done and try to replicate. So um, create a continuum of care where the people are living. When you explain it, you make it sound very easy. Yes, And I is. think a lot of us here are thinking, hmm. And I, I want to pick up on something you said is that you have to delegate. Yeah. And I think what what I'm seeing you do is that you had to build systems where delegation, and I wanted to ask, like, were people ready to delegate that kind of power, and how did you build trust, like, through into the community? So first, you have to delegate, but you have to be sure that the delegation is wise, meaning you delegate something to people who can do it. Uh, n never force people to fail. If I delegate something without uh, giving you the capacity to do it, I'm very bad. I just put you in failure situation, and I will just say, ha ha, you see, it's not me, it's her. <laughs> so um, always delegate and take responsibility of the failure of the people. So it, uh, it obliges you to educate your people. So uh, and all along the chain, and also uh, when I was a minister, I push all my people to go for master degree for two reasons. The, the, the education was not as good as it is now. So by doing a master, they will learn how to generate good data, mm. strategic thinking, uh, analyze those data, cleaning those data, triangulate those data, testing themselves. So I educate them and I have better night. <laughs> I, I want to talk a little bit more, too, about data, because you're really the one who built the data systems and put more evidence-based decisions in. And is that something that you, know, you felt like became, was greater support once people had gotten their masters? Or can you talk a little bit about that, too? Uh, so um, but Rwanda policies are evidence-based by decision. So across the government? Across government. Okay. That means if you come and say, oh, I have a new policies to propose, they say, huh, what it will bring. And this is President Kagame's office Absolutely. saying that. Absolutely. OK. The, the cabinet. The, the, the entire so cabinet. So first of all, when you are minister, is the cabinet. But when you are not minister, is the minister. So you have to, 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 to advocate for your policy and, and give reference like an article, hmm? a scientific article. I found this in the DHS. Those are the data, et cetera. They will say, how do you do these projections? You have to explain. How, um, 
what will be the cost? You have to project your budget the most accurately. So that means um, evidence-based policies. The advantage I had, I always uh, love writing and reading. And uh, I always uh, love people who do research that can impact what I'm doing. So um, what I did, I obliged all the cadre to be global experts in their field. And it's not complicated. If you do malaria, you read everything about malaria, you can do that. Hmm? And bring the ideas that Senegal have done, every place have done for improving your, our own health sector. And it started by the fact that many countries in Africa doesn't progress or are not capable to measure their progress because they don't have data. Mm. When you have data, you can control what you do. You can control what you do against others, but also against yourself. And uh, by doing so, um, uh, you can also see what is wrong in the global reporting system? And there are many things wrong in the global reporting Will system. Will you tell us about a few of those? <laughs> oh, uh, for example, um, and this is still a question for you young guys, a research to do. Uh, we have a, a good family planning process, especially because women can have them in the village. I have to say that the first consultation has to be done in the health center. And after that, they can have injection pills, etc. at home. Um, so when you do a census, is every 10 years, all countries, when they do it. When they do a census, they project the population to come with the rate of fertility of the day. Aha, uh -huh. it's not like the bank. It doesn't change every day. <laughs> and WHO, UNICEF, Gavi, and all those people project, say, OK, you had the rate of 4.4. Uh, so your population, your, your children under five will be this number in five years. So you need to vaccinate this number. And if you say that you vaccinate 90 3% of them, this is the number. But it's not the number, because in the meantime, you have improved your family planning. So you don't produce those baby expected. They cannot understand that. <laughs> hmm? So uh, they take our number, and they say, you vaccinate 80%. It was a, a, a nice fight with Gavi, WHO, and, uh, and UNICEF. They, they published. Uh, and it's one of my interns who just saw, did you see what they published? And they were congratulators. You vaccinate 80% of your kids. Congratulations, Rwanda. But I was mad because I knew that it was more than 90%. <laughs> so I took Twitter. <laughs> and I tweet. You need to follow her if you don't already. <laughs> I tweet. WHO, UNICEF, Gavi, you don't know simple math. Go back to primary school. Did they tweet back to you? Yeah. <laughs> the head of Gavi called me the same night. But also, I call everybody. I make them nightmare. I go to New York headquarters because it was still the day. But uh, I wake up the representative of UNICEF. It was 10 o'clock at night. Uh, He's got nothing else to I do than talk to you. And I was so I was not kind at all. Uh, so uh, they, they were shivering. And they, the, the head of Gavi told me, uh, please remove your tweet. You are a minister of health. <laughs> so I say, he asked me to remove the tweet, but they better go to primary school. <laughs> <laughs> and I did so during, um, uh, it was Friday, sa Saturday, Sunday, Monday, the day after, they call me. We are coming. We do a delegation from Brazzaville, WHO headquarters from Africa, Geneva, and New York. And they were there the next Monday. And I was absolutely, you should have seen me that week. Because normally, to change a report like that, you have to write to your prime minister. The report is fast. The, your, uh, the, could, you, could we act? So through the Minister of Foreign Affairs, through, through uh, Addis Abeba or through Geneva, 
they call. So it takes six months. And after that, they say it's too late. We change the next one. But the report is there. They, in four days, they were promising to come here. So I wrote, they promised to come here, but they, they still have. But also, they changed their website the same night before midnight. Oh, wow. They say 80%, that's what UNICEF WHO say, Rwanda strongly protest, and it was not Rwanda, it was me mad in my, <laughs> in my living room. And, uh, uh, and say it's 90. So we have two points, a, a red and a, and, and, and a, and a, uh, a green. And uh, a, a comment in the column, I found that fantastic. That so the tweet, I didn't let it go. And so they came. And during the meeting, they ask me, please stop tweeting. <laughs> and I say, I will never stop tweeting. So I tweeted, they're in front of me. Maybe now they qualify for secondary school. <laughs> and then in three days, they review our data, and it was even better, 97%. Oh, wow. hmm? So um, yeah, we do fight, and we enjoy it. <laughs> Do you have any recommendations for us for trying to convince our leaders to believe data? <laughs> uh, yeah, you have a strange thing here. Where the, <laughs> you don't want evidence based, so that's uh, uh, very funny. I, think, I don't know if we'd say funny. <laughs> no, no, I, th I think you should find something going in front of him and say, I'm this, and he will say, no, it's evidence based. And, and I don't know, but you, you need to confront. Uh, stupid asset with stupidities, <laughs> mm? and 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 try to embarrass that, so showing that he need data as well. Yeah. Mm? I I would love to talk to you a little bit and taking us in a bit of a direction back to the community health workers and. Um, we've seen it start to be applied a little bit here in the U.S. And I know reverse innovation, the idea that learnings in lower income societies are applicable in wealthier countries um, is possible, alive and well, and smart. Could you talk a little bit maybe about community health workers or some other aspect of reverse innovation that you're seeing or you're excited about? So I think community health work is a good example. Uh, you have uh, many people with chronic disease in their house uh, that, and you have many people suffering from depression, uh, many people disconnected from their community because they don't have a community. Uh, and uh, because of that, you have many people that are not compliant to treatment. And it has been studied by anthropologists and it's because of lack of social capital. Give you the example, uh, all the countries that were uh, uh, analyzed by do, do this team of anthropologists from Harvard had better compliance than New York or other place in, in this country. And the, 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 they searched why, and it was the social capital. Meaning, if I have a chronic disease, because I'm near my sister or I'm near somebody, I don't, I will take my drugs because all chronic disease, we go with depression, a, a certain level of depression. And when you are fed up, that day you don't take your drugs, your medicine. But here you take it because of the social capital, meaning for your sister, your mother, your brother, or your community health worker, or your nurse, not to face you in, in bed, bad health. And here people are alone. Mm. They will see their doctors on appointment and for small time. And in the meantime, they may have nobody. If there was a community health worker or a link between, it can, it can be the person who bring the mail. It can be a, a system created that suit the US where at least somebody talk to you and can evaluate if you are okay. And because you know that that person talk to you to evaluate if you are okay, you'll feel reassured. Mm. You'll feel less depressed. You'll feel more connected. You'll feel more secure. And this will rebuild social capital. I never see 
people as wealthy than here with so many poor, with so many distrust, with so many uh, loneliness, and it's not normal. And with so many people who could be this connection between health system and your home. And um, so where it has been built, it has shown a decrease in emergency medicine, the most costly. It has shown a win-win situation for the people, for their family, but also for the system. Health insurance pay less. So it's even an economic imperative. You, you know, you've spoken about that, about health is a good investment for yeah. countries. Can you say a little bit more about that as well? Uh, because um, health is always a big consumer. But also, it allows people to be big producer of whatever. Your energy at work, your, your imagination, what you will produce, etc. So there is a good uh, uh, report done in The Lancet, uh, investing in health how it generates money. So it seems that you, people just see what you invest. They don't calculate what come out of it. So okay. they just think about the expense. They don't yeah. think about the, the outcomes. outcomes. Hmm? And um, the outcomes are great. Can you imagine that it contributes so much to the GDP? Hmm? A good family planning program a good uh, nutrition program. It has been proven that uh, people well-fed uh, have 20% uh, more income when they are adults. So this income is, is shared by, because there isn't. So con if we continue program by program, it's a good investment to invest in health. I'm thinking about we, when you think about the context here in the U.S., we talked a little bit about this with the loneliness, and this is also something that is acute in the U.K., as you know. Um, I would love to imagine you being in charge of uh, our health system here in the U.S. What would be the first thing you would do? And, and, I, and I say that with a backdrop of a sense of hopelessness a little bit. Um, and frustration about our health care. So you're, there's, there's an aspect of emotional health, which is not just the isolation, but a little bit of this frustration, or a lot of this frustration, and then the quality of health care itself. So I, I will <clears throat> remember that I'm a woman, and so I multitasked, because there are so <laughs> much things to do. I think you have to fix health insurance. Okay. Uh, without any mercy, they should stop to be wealthy on the expense of the health of the people and uh, <clears throat> do whatever you have to do to fix that. Make sure that uh, we revisit the health sector to make it um, uh, compliant with service to be provided to the most vulnerable. This will be enough because it, uh, it includes community health work approach. It will create some, some of the young students talk about Umuganda. Uh, there are many things you have to do out of the health sector to recreate this dynamic. But if you, you, you revisit the health insurance system and you revisit the systems to make sure that nobody is excluded, you will make it. Hmm? And um, <clears throat> I will consider two blocks as a village. And I will ask everybody to come on the place once a year to elect the community health workers. We will take those people. They will be among people who, can, who are young enough, because it takes time, who want to dedicate their time for that. And that will be retributed for that and train for that, and they will visit the block, and this will be their job. They'd have to be smiling, optimist, and uh, bringing joy where they go. And finish, you'll get a health system that suits your needs. 
Again, you're making it sound very easy. <laughs> no, but I, I will stop to, uh, I will penalize a lot uh, excessive, uh, uh, um, extreme therapeutic end of life. Because it doesn't, it's painful, it doesn't make you happy, and you'll die anyway. Mm. So I will just say revisit death so that it's a healthy death and uh, more compassionate death and more with the people you love. And because you'll have community health workers block coming together around one program, you'll have a community. You'll belong somewhere. And America will start to be great again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's shift gears a little bit now to the University of Global Health Equity. What's your vision of it in, say, five years with your background in teaching and now building a health sector, but also looking now at the applicability of lessons in Rwanda to other parts of the world? So let's give us seven years. Okay. Not five. Because we start medical education in 2019. And one uh, cohort is six years. So the first cohort will be out. Uh, the first cohort will be from Rwanda, because we start for, with Rwanda. And how many and so in the first let's, cohort? So let's give us eight years, because the second cohort will have. <laughs> you can have, take 10 if you want. <laughs> yeah, 10 years. So now we'll have people from all over the world, because for the master degree, we have already 11 African countries, but we have also people from Nepal, Bangladesh, US, uh, Australia. So it will be the same. And those people with a lot of knowledge how to build the health sector focus on targeting the most vulnerable because the principle is if we build a health sector that targets the, the, the grandchild of the most destitute grandma, all grandchild of the country will be safe. And they are ready to do that all over the world, to go and build hospital, district system, be Minister of Health, we don't care, but for programs that, that leave no one out. So this is my vision. That's incredible. No, no, it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> how many uh, students do you have now? 48. 48, and how many will be in the first cohort of the medical school? 24. 24. And we are going to increase up to have 72 per cohort. Um, but because the, the, the type of education we want to, go, of course we want to educate totally differently. Of course we are not going to change the function of a lung and how a lung function and they have to care, but how they have to care about that lung will change. And uh, for this we need small classes, not more than 24. So we will multiply maximum 30. We, we will have several first year class, etc. So, this is the plan, but after that, we will have um, a center of research where we will do clinical trial in a more equitable manner, implementation science, because everything is about implementation. If now we just implement what we already know, we will save millions of lives overnight. Hmm? So implementation science, how to do things to have the outcome we want. Population science to know, hmm? you know, like the census and all those things. Uh, hmm? You can help Gavi with that. Absolutely, <laughs> uh, absolutely, and and um, other other things. A community college, and also for study how to produce better uh, community health workers, and also to teach how to teach them, so that we can serve. Um, uh, other countries, and also this new cadre, four months treatment, uh, four months uh, education plus two months uh, practicum that follow chronic disease at home and uh, accompany end of life um, with dignity where you live. So we, we will have that, but we will have also master in one health, master in um, emergency, outbreak management, you know, um, Ebola will be here again. It was here once, be careful for the next time. 
the world is a, is a small village. Uh, one uh, health and gender. Hmm? You know, there are so many bad things that is done. You know that big pharma just has the drugs on young white men, not women, because first of all, we are hysterical, we have menstruation, we are pregnant, etc. so we are not interesting. And us, <laughs> women, we swallow drugs made for young men. You know that? So we need to change a lot of things. Health and law, many laws are obstacle for universal health care. Uh, health and procurement, many countries missed up and have stuck out. Mm -hmm. Health finance, many revised the health insurance, know how to do those things, how to manage and deal with budget, uh, public budget, performance-based financing, health insurance, and how to do that. So we are growing. That's wonderful. And I just, as you were talking about the procurement and the logistics, it reminded me of something Bill Gates said one time when asked about global health, what he think the most important thing was going forward. And he said to run a really good grocery store. The point being that so much of good health care is the implementation side. So, um, I have some questions for you, but we thought maybe we would do a round of rapid questions for Dr. Anya. So we're going to take about five minutes and do some kind of different fun questions. So one's off the top of your head. What's your favorite book or article that you've read lately? I read. Hmm. Um, I love uh, Repair the World from Paul Farmer. OK. If you could learn one new skill, what would it be? Hmm. Uh, if I can knew one new skill, what can it be? Ah, piano. <laughs> <laughs> My mother-in-law is a great pianist. Sorry? My mother-in-law is a great pianist. Yeah, but I'm very bad in music. That's <laughs> what I say. Would love to learn that. <laughs> What's the best holiday you've ever taken? Oh, so many. <laughs> um, the, I, I remember going with my daughters when they were small in Italy. Uh, coming from France, where we were working, we didn't have a lot of money. We change, and we believe that the rate was this. And in the middle, when we change again, we realize we have the double money of uh, what. So we <laughs> really enjoy. <laughs> Our budget was double in the middle of the holidays. Do you take the rest of your holidays there, too? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, now what's your worst holiday? My worst holidays? I never knew, because if it's worse, I go. Hmm, OK. When you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? A healer. Oh. And if you had one piece of advice to give a young person interested in medicine and global health, what would it be? Follow your heart, your dream, and your passion. I think that's good for all of us. I'm going to um, now move to some of the questions from all of you. Thank you. Was there a turning point for Rwanda to create better commitment to, health, to a healthcare system? And then, yep, we'll stop there. Say it again. Was there a turning point for Rwanda to create a commitment to a better healthcare system? I think that the, <clears throat> um, it was there from the beginning after the genocide. Uh, the team that uh, uh, stopped the genocide under President Kagame had that in their political manifesto. So they had a manifesto that was designed that they say, if one day we have the power, we will give health for all. So the means were not there. The people to make it happen were not there. But the, the, the political will was, was there from the, from the beginning. And it sounds like the manifesto was a unifying feature it, that brought people together. It, it has helped that. But mm. it was created before the genocide. Okay. Mm? Ah, okay. Yeah, before. Um, we know climate change and extreme weather patterns are impacting particularly children's health. And I'm wondering, what, how are you thinking about that in Rwanda? So <clears throat> we need to um, be ready for uh, already the problem out there, uh, global warming and mosquitoes. Uh, <clears throat> we have f uh, 10 times more malaria today. Uh, no, it, it, 10 times more malaria in 2016 than 
in 2012. We were about to, to, to join the <coughs> countries of uh, malaria elimination. We had 260,000 cases a year, and in 2016, we had 2,500,000. Thanks to community health workers and fixed things in the program, uh, we didn't have the 10 times more death. However, <coughs> it's a problem because each case of malaria, it's a cure, and it costs. So it's really sunk family income. So the day uh, somebody asked me among the young people how we will be independent one day, the, f the cost will be on health system, in, uh, on health insurance and family. So it can be a huge cost. To, we are 12 million people and we had 2 million point five cases of malaria. Rwanda is in the middle. Uh, we are surrounded by Burundi, Congo, Uganda, Tanzania. A mosquito can cross Rwanda during his lifetime. Born in Uganda, die in Burundi. <laughs> and every day, poor babies, a lot of babies along the way. So <clears throat> the solution will not be Rwandan. The solution will be African. We cannot put a big red nets around Rwanda. Yeah. Also drone, uh, the, uh, the, the la sécheresse, uh, drown, drought. I, drought. Never, I cannot, <laughs> I had that word, and I had that situation. <laughs> but it will bring malnutrition. Hmm? So that means we have to be very careful. The gain we had in under five mortality need to be really protected. Hmm? You can see in um, uh, some, uh, in East Europe, not the southeast of Europe, uh, people are moving to cities because they can no longer feed their family. They bring in cities. And when they dislike the leadership, there is unrest. So drought, will bring unrest, movement of population. In movement of population, don't talk about vaccination. Mm. Don't talk about creating a health system. Yes, you have to, but they will be lost in gain. Mm? And this is, of course, bad leadership. But because people are fed up, because they are dying anyway. So they cannot stay there and hope to build a life because they will die there. So they move and they join. So climate change will bring a hard time for the vulnerable people, increase the number of vulnerable people, and decrease uh, the people who can benefit of primary care. So is there a, what, what do you recommend as a plan then? So I can say what we do yeah. uh, in Rwanda is uh, to improve irrigation uh, and also to um, improve the way we feed children um, to, 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 to do body reserve, not as much as I did for myself, but mm -hmm. hmm? to do it. And I think you're, you're, it's a good example, too, of how much healthcare is not just within the health sector, but it... It's a it's cross a sector. Cross. It's agriculture. It's water and sanitation. It's it's throughout. So improve water and sanitation. Improve uh, search of uh, uh, water drainage and uh, uh, protect the water. Hmm? So there is a lot of things to, we can do, and also select more nutrition uh, seeds, uh, so that even if you collect less. You are better fed. There is a lot of things to do, but uh, it's a cross sector. And the master we do, the master in health service delivery, are not for clinician only. We have veterinarian, agriculture, program manager, uh, local leaders, national leaders who are taking it. You may have some more applications to your master's program after tonight. No problem. We have we have uh, how many Americans? 
three and two. Yeah, five. Okay. In the U.S., we often think of healthcare as a benefit. How do you believe Americans can overcome this mindset? Uh, by creating what I told you before, you need to recreate uh, social capital. How do, if you if you promote it, and if you convince people that some of you, of of you are not doesn't deserve the best, you will not say that it's a human right to have access to health. So uh, to change that, you need to change social behavior, social discourse. Uh, you need to combat structural violence um, in the society uh, and uh, promote equity. Because it is even in all those uh, cartoon that the kids are watching, they are extremely racist. Mm. They are, they, uh, and even the language. May I will change the language too. Do you know what Black Sunday mean? It was the day where the, they was um, sold on slave. And now we talk about Black Sunday or something. You should never refer to a Black Sunday. It should be verboten. Hmm? So there is a lot of things that, inconsciently, we are all cultivating that cultivate the bad side of the society. Well, I don't even think Americans realize, I mean, to your point about some of the things that are every day that are racist or... Cultivate the intolerance, the fact that one race value less than another and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. You mentioned a cartoon. I'm curious, which, uh, is there one in, in? Look, all the bad guys look like Arabs. Mm. Isn't it? Before it was Chinese. And before that it was Russians. You know, with the accent. So the child associate that even before understand what it is. And you create fear. And face quickly done, you know? Maybe you need to start also an art institute at the Health of Global Equity to do communications. Our, our students will have to take art. That's wonderful. Maybe okay. piano. <laughs> <laughs> All right, your next question. What is your number one example of reverse innovation that you would like to see implemented in Western countries? And I'm not gonna let you talk about community health workers again. Insurance. Sorry? Insurance. Okay. We have a community health insurance where um, uh, that it stratifies according revenue and uh, without all the layer of um, all those layers who swallow the money of the health insurance. Uh, but also uh, it works because it's full solidarity. People like me will pay $12 per capita for all my family. Hmm? Uh, others pay five. 25% pay zero because they are too poor to pay. So the government and the partners pay for them. At each point of care, you pay 10%. Everybody pay 10%, but the poor doesn't pay 10%. Um, so this principle, I don't say that you can have that for five dollars, but those principles should apply here, and uh, you will see you will rebalance things. This is one. You have more. Uh, another one. Um, um, not community health, but the linkage between community and health facilities should be uh, strength. The other one is end of life should be considered differently. Do you know that an average American under your head, even when you are young and healthy like you are, it's $11,000 per capita that is spent around health. That's not normal because two thirds of that is during the three years, the three last years of life. Hmm? 
So this should be revisited. Second, the power of doctors. They are dictators. And m many of them uh, play too much secure and too much the portfolio, the money of their clients. So what I want to say through that is I will give more voice to you, the, the patient. And I will penalize all doctors that doesn't give the full range of opportunities. Many doctors doesn't give that. They give what suits them. But also I will change education because their education doesn't prepare them to say that. So you have to change education, you have to change medical practice, and you have to change patient practice. They have to express their voice more. All right. Uh, next question. You talk about positive discrimination for gender equality. Has this had any adverse effects? And does Rwanda also use policies like affirmative action? We did. Absolutely. So that means in Rwanda, if a woman go and say, I was raped by this one, that one is closed. And after that, assessment starts. Contrary of where you have to go prove claim and be in undignified situation. So there are some women who have abuse, but the abuse of that by women was so little compared to the abuse of men before. Hmm? So there is no perfect situation. Hmm? Um, and um, so it has some adverse effects, but it has less adverse, the, the positive you know, it's negative, positive. The positive is so huge mm. that, okay. And bringing it back here to the US, do you think we can make positive discrimination work here? You could, if you organize yourself. <laughs> because, uh, okay, when was it? It was uh, one year and something, no? Uh, one year and something ago, you did a great march all over the country, etc. But you forgot to organize yourself after that. Mm. Huh? The women's march. Yeah, but no, the women coming together. Uh, and this coming together, uh, it's still there, but so diluted. So you, I don't believe that you have to, work, to wait for men with positive mind to organize the society differently. Hmm? We had that, thanks God. We never had too much for that. But you have to organize yourself and you have tools for that. Go and vote. Don't sleep that day. You slept last time, look where you are. <laughs> Rwanda is seeing a rise in non-communicable non diseases like cancer. As management of these diseases, uh, I might need help with this one, in more uh, is more difficult outside of the hospital. How would you like to see Rwanda manage this? So uh, I don't believe there is more non-communicable disease than before, but people die later, so they have time to express themselves. Um, so how we have to organize that, we have to build an extra service on what we have built already. And uh, as I told you, this new type of cadre to follow people at home, they will have a tablet, they will have direct communication with nurses and doctors, and they can do a lot at home without hospitalization, without obliged people to go every two weeks uh, very far when they are sick and tired. So this is the way to manage it. Uh, problem with some drugs, like in, uh, some medicine, like uh, uh, insulin, etc. We need to figure out how to do that. Uh, can it be a portable fridge? Small, yes. Um, and um, uh, bring some 
package uh, and change it every two days, yes, everything is possible. You can do that. Hmm? Uh, I know that somebody uh, work with Gate and did some fridge like that uh, that uh, kept things cold for one week. So of course it will cost money, but you see that there is there is a way to do it. Mm. Huh? A reverse innovation to make it cheaper and a way to distribute so that people can have insulin at home. There is a way to do that. And I was just remembering too, Rwanda was one of the, is the first country to be testing drones for um, blood tests, I believe, or you no, should you should distribute uh, blood. It is for okay, for distributing blood. So um, <clears throat> There are people that, that during the, the, the raining season, there are some roads that you cannot practice, that are not usable. So um, when this opportunity came, uh, we jump in. Because the idea to bring uh, bl uh, blood somewhere using drone, hmm, it was, first of all, very exciting. It was a great challenge. Um, and it works, hmm? um, uh, and it works. And now, the by the way, the 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 partners we for the drone, the owner of the drone, because it's a service we rent, like DHL. I should not supposed to say. Remove that from the <laughs> things. <laughs> Distribution of package. Um, I know DHL, FedEx. There are so many others. I love all of them, <laughs> but none of them will distribute my blood on time, but a drone. So people are doing the um, order using a phone. Somebody go to the blood bank that is near the drone port, put the blood, do a JPS or something on the computer, and the drone go alone, wipes, drop, doesn't stop, Drop the, the 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 blood on something like uh, you know uh, a tama that is soft, and go back home. And blood is delivered, and within thirty five minutes, so you can save life with very little stockage of blood. Before we had five places where the drug the the blood was stored. And we lost a lot for not using, and sometimes we don't have the right one. Now we have one place where we have more. So it seems to be very expensive. Like all innovation, when you start, is more expensive. So money is, a, is, 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 is really a myth. Now the life save and the decrease of the cost, because those drones do other things for other sectors. Win-win hmm? situation. And a potentially replicable model for other places. Of course, places. but you need to put everybody around the table, because drones are uh, uh, flying objects, like plane. So regulated by the civil aviation, uh, you need to put the security organ, because they need to see that you don't go and do some photos someplace where you don't have to do photos. Uh, you need to reassure your neighbor's country that you are not going to, because for a health facility that is near there, that you are not going to do that as well. So it's really uh, putting people together that um, our neighbor countries have to do before doing that. But for, imagine a country as big as Ethiopia. What are they going to win with that? I'm gonna, I, we have time for about one or two more questions, and thank you all for your questions. So if I don't get to them, you, hopefully we'll get you after. Um, but speaking about other countries, which, which of the innovations are you seeing in Rwanda that you think are particularly applicable to other African countries? We spent some time talking about the US, but what about other African countries? Oh, all of them. That mean, Nothing is, rep the, I, the best practice is uh, also a myth. If you come and you copy and you are going to implement, be sure you'll fail. Study the principle behind. Go to the people and say, if you want to reach this, how to do that? 
And so replicate the principle, not the action. Hmm? So everything is replicable. Even success done here is replicable. There are many good lessons to have from some part of this country that we, we need to study. Hmm? The great thing is Pakistan, how they manage TB. Nepal, under five mortality, they did great. So there are a lot of lessons across the world. We just have to be open mind. And it's in Rwanda because it has to be somewhere. But it's the University of Global Health Equity. Equity because you leave no one out. The most important word is not university, it's equity. All right, I think this will probably be our last question. How, um, actually I'll, answer, I'll give you this one. What are your views on the effectiveness of organizations like Doctors Without Borders? First of all, it's not one organization. Europe, US are different. And in Europe, Belgium and France are different. They are impacted by the philosophy of the leader. So some are good, some are bad. So needed, the good one. I feel like there's more we could talk about there, but <laughs> unfortunately we are out of time. Um, before we open up the floor for discussion with those of you in the room, I would like to say thank you to you, Dr. Anyas, for this excellent discussion. Thank you. Thank you.